seven kilograms per person per day. That's the average amount of carbon dioxide produced in Peninsula Malaysia just from electricity generation alone in 2021. More CO2 in the atmosphere equals to global temperature rise equals to climate change. That's something we all should be familiar with by now. And here we are releasing seven kilograms for every man, woman and child every single day. What does that look like? Well, seven kilograms is the allowable weight limit of your carry-on bag for a typical economy class airline ticket. And that's just the weight of one day's CO2. Imagine everyone here today having 365 of those bags filled to its maximum weight limit. That's what one year's worth of average electricity emissions looks like. I was in the energy industry for 20 years. I had the opportunity to work across a wide spectrum of power generation technologies. And I also really enjoy playing with numbers related to energy. Back in 2011, about halfway through my career at that point, I was introduced to a book that would really broaden the way I thought about energy, really open my mind, show me new perspectives. It's called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air by the late Professor David Mackay from Cambridge University. And it's actually available for free on his website. Now in the book, he uses real data, some basic mathematics, and a lot of approximate calculations. He calls these back of the envelope calculations. He uses all of this to present a lot of interesting insights and observations about energy in ways that we usually don't think about. Now what he does in the book is not intended to be 100% precise, but it's there more to give us some context for numbers which can sometimes be a bit obscure. Help us get an appreciation of the scale and magnitude of things. But most importantly, to make us go, hmm, that's interesting. And hopefully to trigger a desire to make us learn more. Now, the book really inspired me to look at energy from so many new and different perspectives than I had done before. As Professor Mackay puts it, he, it helped me to focus on the numbers, not the adjectives, to see if those numbers actually made sense. And to try and put those numbers in a way which is easier to visualize, a lot more relatable, just like our seven kilogram luggage example earlier. So what I'd like to do today is share some of my own observations about energy in the context of Peninsula Malaysia through my own back of the envelope calculations that I've been tinkering around with over the past few years, inspired by Professor Mackay. Some of the things we're going to talk about may not be very obvious. They may not necessarily align with the mainstream narratives about energy that you're used to hearing about. They may even be counterintuitive to some of the assumptions you might already have, but that's where their value is to make us see things differently, think about energy differently. So let's just play with some numbers and see where it takes us. I'd like to start off by taking a look at electricity generation and emissions in Peninsula Malaysia over the past five years. So if you look at the trend of electricity, it's rising from 2018 to 2019, and there's a drop off in 2020. That's when the pandemic happened. That's when we all went into lockdown. That's when everything pretty much shut down. And as life slowly starts going back to normal, you can see that the trend starts rising back up again. That line looks logical. It kind of looks like what we would expect to happen under the circumstances. Now, I'm sure most of us would recall hearing news back in 2020 during the pandemic about how the environment was getting cleaner the earth was healing itself because all the humans were now stuck indoors, right? On one hand, that makes sense. There's less cars in the road, less planes in the sky, 
less economic activity, hence less pollution. But if we just zoom in and look at the electricity sector in Malaysia and the emissions from it, that assumption starts to break down. Carbon emissions actually peaked in 2020, the year of the pandemic. Now, doesn't that go against what we would have expected to happen? So let's try and dive a bit deeper. Let's try to figure out why this unusual phenomenon happens. Let's try and look at where all that electricity is actually coming from. Right at the bottom, we've got hydro and solar. They're pretty constant across the five years, but they don't really contribute a lot to the overall electricity. Higher up, we've got natural gas, which has a pattern that kind of follows the overall pattern of electricity. It's going, it's going up, it drops in 2020, and it picks up again after that. So far, so good. Nothing out of the ordinary. Let's look at coal instead. And this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. Coal is the largest contributor to Malaysia's electricity at the moment. And you can see that coal use was actually the highest in 2020. So while we certainly did use less electricity, we did produce less electricity, a lot more of that actually came from burning more coal, which is what resulted in the higher emissions. This is a case study where the numbers clearly contradict what our default assumptions would have been. In this particular situation, reducing electricity generation did not reduce emissions. It had the opposite effect instead. That's something for you to take away and ponder upon. Let's shift gears, move on to something else. Let's take a look at the potential health impacts arising from the way we produce electricity in this country at the moment. This is a chart by Our World in Data that shows the safest and cleanest sources of energy ranked from worst to best. Now, it's no surprise that coal has the highest mortality rate of about 25 deaths per terawatt hour of electricity generated. And a lot of that basically comes from air pollution. This is based on global statistics. So if we take these global numbers, and apply it to the way we produce electricity in Malaysia right now, it turns out that we have a mortality of about 1,900 to 2,000 deaths per year on average, just from the way we produce electricity. Now, these are not deaths that we can actually go out there and verify. All we're doing is we're taking global statistics and applying it to a local context. But what we can say is that our dependence on fossil fuels has potential health impacts which we don't even realize. That's in the region of a few thousand people per year, and that's a lot. Before I walk away from this slide, let's, let me just draw your attention to something that's a bit more interesting. Now, despite it's unfavorable public perception, despite all the bad news you might have heard about it over the years. Let's take a moment to notice just how low nuclear energy is on that list, both in terms of mortality and emissions based on science, based on data. It's virtually on the same level as wind and solar, which people seem to like a lot more. Now, if you find that unusual, Maybe it's something you want to take away and explore a bit more in the future. I'm more than happy to have a conversation about it if anybody's curious. But we'll save that for another day. Moving on. When we talk about energy, right, the fact that Malaysia is heavily dependent on fossil fuels is very obvious. The solution to our dependence on fossil fuels is clearly to use more low-carbon electricity sources. But unfortunately, that's not really as straightforward as it sounds. For our next example, let's, let's just take a look at solar. That's the most popular form of renewable energy in Malaysia at the moment. Let's try and compare coal, gas, and solar in terms of how much land 
use they require. How much land would we require to provide enough electricity for the whole of Peninsular Malaysia just using each of these three sources on their own? Assuming ideal conditions, of course. If we just go 100% coal, it turns out that we need about 9 square kilometres of land. That's what 9 square kilometres looks like. It's a pretty big chunk of Subang. But covering all that with coal power plants would provide enough electricity for the whole of Peninsular Malaysia. Let's go one step further. Let's go 100% gas instead. If we go 100% natural gas, we need about 3 square kilometres. Slightly more compact. But we've got to bear in mind that this land is just for the gas power plant itself. It doesn't include the pipelines, the gas processing facilities, the gas extraction infrastructure. It's just the power plants. Now, let's try to get really clean and go 100% solar. Now, the thing about solar I'm sure you're all aware of is that the sun doesn't shine at night, right? So to go 100% solar, we need batteries as backup. Batteries need to be charged. So now, we need a bunch of solar panels just to provide the electricity that we need in the daytime. We need another bunch of solar panels, a lot more, just to charge the batteries so that we can have electricity when the sun goes down. Again, if we assume ideal conditions, no haze, no flooding, no extended um, rainy period, then we run the numbers. It turns out that we need about at least 5,600 square kilometers of land. That's what 5,600 square kilometers looks like. At 70% the land of Selangor and Kuala Lumpur. It's a lot of land, a lot of deforestation, and a whole host of other issues, which are not going to go away even if you break that up and spread it around the rest of the country. Let's try and get a bit smarter with what we're doing now. Before we do this, let's cover all suitable rooftops across Peninsular Malaysia with solar panels. Now, rooftops are free real estate for solar. So let's take advantage of that. If we do that, it turns out that that would be enough to provide us with about half the electricity required. So now we just need land for the other half. That works out to about 2,800 square kilometers. Still a lot of land. That's 35% the land of KL and Selangor. It's worth remembering, this does not include the land that we need for the batteries. That's another issue. So which of these is the better option? Of course, there's a lot of other considerations we haven't thought about yet. But what trade-offs would be worth it for each of these situations? Is there any way we can get the best of both worlds? Is there any way we can generate large amounts of low carbon electricity with a small land footprint? All interesting questions for you to take away and think about. In reality, we would never use 100% of any particular fuel source. There will always be a mix of them working together, complementing each other. But I hope this example shows you the significant difference, the orders of magnitude in difference when you're comparing dense sources of electricity like coal and gas versus diffuse sources of energy like solar or even wind for that matter. When we talk about energy, more often than not, the conversation tends to focus on carbon and cost. We spoke about carbon at the beginning of the talk. And then we moved on to some unconventional topics like health and land. There are a lot more aspects of energy that don't really come to the fore. They get buried under this focus that we seem to have on carbon and cost. So with the remaining time I've left, let's just quickly go through a few of them in a nutshell. Sunlight, wind, water. All of these are called clean, renewable, because we don't burn anything. We don't have 
to combust. We don't release CO2 when we use them to produce electricity. They're called renewable because they don't run out. But let's be honest here. We don't use sunlight, water, or wind to charge our mobile phones or power our laptops. We use electricity. And to turn these raw elements of nature into electricity, that's why we need solar panels and wind turbines and hydroelectric dams. And all of these things don't just appear out of thin air like magic. They are the end result of an industrial process that requires mining, manufacturing, construction, transportation, and a whole host of other things. And there are a lot of issues around these kind of activities that are starting to become more and more apparent as the global demand for clean energy sources skyrockets. There's environmental damage caused by mining. There's pollution from manufacturing and construction. There's the scarcity of the raw materials that we require. There's waste management issues. Yes, renewable energy has waste management issues from the improper disposal of solar panels and wind turbines. There are even allegations of human rights abuses happening in the supply chains for some of these technologies. Now, all of these are issues worth talking about, but not many people seem to be focusing on it when they talk about the energy transition that we are on. These are critical issues, and we should be discussing them more. So I hope my talk has given you new and different perspectives to view energy from. We know that our current energy system is broken. There are cracks in it. We know that we need to move on to a new and a better one. But there's no magical solution here. Just a whole bunch of compromises having to work together. Now, I'm a big fan of all options to decarbonize electricity. But we have to go into this energy transition with our eyes and our minds open. Because we don't want to replace a cracked energy system that we have now with a newer one that comes with cracks we didn't even realize were there. Climate change is a serious issue. Carbon emissions is a concern. It's a significant concern, but it shouldn't be the only concern. And it's only by looking at data from different points of view can we appreciate the fact that in this world of sustainable energy, there's a lot more than meets the eye. Thank you.